to whichever podium he prefers um, to deliver some closing remarks. Uh, Professor Luke Gibbons, who is Professor of Irish Literary uh, and Cultural Studies uh, in the uh, National University of Ireland, Maynooth, and of course, as we all know, over the past uh, 30 years or so, one of Ireland's leading post-colonial critics, and therefore as apt a speaker as any to finish this symposium. So perhaps we'll... Thanks very much, Quibi, and thanks to all the organizers of the event. Um, something I think it was Ashley said, Luke is supposed to bring the good news. Well, the gospel, Luke's gospel does mean good news. So I'm afraid. Mine won't be quite good news either, but it'll be more trying to tie up a few loose ends, loose ends. Um, when Declan brought up the question about what are the Irish in terms of colonialism, Joyce had a good intervention in Finnegan's Way. He said, "Where the English are full stoppers, they like things brought to a close, but the Irish are semi-colonials." <laughs> the Irish never know when to stop them. And that notion of the Irish as semi colonials I think, runs through a lot of the conference. And in a sense, my remarks will be just picking up on kind of connections that previous speakers made. And one kind of linking um, connective tissue might be a phrase that comes up in that. Uh, the film we saw this morning by Alan Freeland, this notion of the choreography of coincidences, the notion that accidents are waiting to happen. And it's remarkable how much overlaps were between the papers, as if there was a kind of choreography behind the scenes. And indeed, when you go to the exhibition, we all are kind of choreographers of a sort, and we make connections between works that may be totally beyond the intentions of the artists, let alone the curators. And I think that idea, when John Logan was talking about the walls of Limerick, I was going to ask him, how come that becomes the name of a dance? <laughs> it becomes a kind of choreography. The, the solid walls turn into the mobility and the eloquence of the body. And in a way, when we make those kind of connections ourselves as we go around the exhibition <coughs> and indeed respond to the speakers. And when I think Grant Watson was talking this morning about Reverend, Reverend Drana Tagore's Indian connections with Europe and vice versa. And he, and he did mention in passing his connection with W.B. Yeats. But Tagore's, you know, in one sense, more powerful connections was with Patrick Pierce, the leader of the 1916 Rising, because it, Tagore modeled his school in India on St. Endes, Pierce's experimental school in that farm. And if we're bringing coincidences even further, it was the staging of Tagore's play, The Post Office, attended by Patrick Pierce and several signatories of the proclamation that made people think, maybe we should put on a real piece of street theatre around the corner from the alley in the post office itself. And the choice of the post office as the center of the rebellion and as the center of the rising. And it's that connection, it's that term, post office, that I think is a key way of revisiting the notion of post-colonial. As was pointed out there by service speakers, the word post needs to be rescued from its temporal aspects and needs to be repositioned in terms of post office, the post of post haste, the post of communications, the post of the letter, indeed the post of traffic, and the post of communications between different zones. And it's that concept of post that's most relevant to post-colonialism. The post-colonialism is now, it's not in the past. So this notion that the word post uh, operates at many different levels that I think are important for kind of seeing how the various contributions made from, 
from the floor and indeed from the speakers at the conference link up on this. So this notion that the post uh, is kind of out of is a kind of time out of joint. The times are out of joint in post-colonialism. That brings up one of the key questions that was, I think, flagged in many different talks. And it has to do with a concept that wasn't overtly stated, but I think is implicit in a lot of the contributions. And it's what Freud called belatedness, or what is sometimes misunderstood as anachronism, or indeed came up in a slightly different term, the invention of tradition. The notion, in a sense, that the past is fixed, and that the past is over and done with, and that if you do anything else with the past, you're inventing it, which I would really try and contest and try and interrogate. The past is not over and done with. As William Faulkner said, it's not even past. And the idea that the past is still part of the present. In fact, it may be that the present, in some important ways, is trying to catch up with the past, rather than the other way around. And a key version of that, and this would be going back to the leaders of the 1916 rebellion, a book that, that is a remarkable book that, was, that coincided more or less with the publication of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man is Thomas McDonough's Literature in Ireland. McDonough had a literal deadline when he was reading, when he was correcting the proofs. A lot of us have pressure of correcting proofs, but very few of us face a, a firing squad because McDonough was desperately trying to finish the proofs in James' factory, knowing he was going to be executed. And he handed in half-baked proofs. <coughs> but when Joyce's portrait came out, it was received through the prism of McDonough's remarkable book. McDonough, born in Plot Jordan, not a stone's throw from here. And in that book, McDonough brings up the whole question of the avant-garde and its relationship to revolution. And he makes explicit the idea that revolution and the avant-garde at least share this in common that the present has not caught up with them. That the avant-garde is trying to create its own future. I was hoping that sometime in the future, the present will catch up with it. But, and Ezra Pound says, the poets are the antennae of the race. They're the outriders. And the avant-garde have no mandate on the present. That's why people do not relate to the avant-garde. That's why the avant-garde is seen as elitist. That's why it's seen as having no popular currency. But that's part of its project. This part of its project is not to answer to the present, it's to make the future. So the idea that the avant-garde have no mandate is precisely what Thomas McDonough seizes on by, relating, by talking about the futurists. So McDonough talks about futurism as having the future on its side. And it's precisely that way of looking at the 1916 rebellion that relates a revolution that had no mandate in the present. And it is true, and historians constantly point out they had no mandate, so it's illicit. But in fact, their mandate was coming from the future. And they made that expressly clear. All of them almost said, we, we are going to be castigated and ostracized now, but and our revolution will be illegitimate if the future doesn't catch up with it. And it's a good question whether the future ha has caught up with it. Part of the state's embarrassment over commemoration <coughs> is that it may, it's a good question whether the proclamation, if you like, moderate and all as it was, and toned down as it was, if the state has even caught up with some of the primary pronouncements of the proclamation, not least the idea that public good always trumps private interest. And it's ironic that the very buildings that the rebels ended up with in Moore Street should be appropriated by a developer who was, who was going to demolish the buildings and was calling the state's bluff. And the state wasn't even prepared or originally to even try and protect its own foundations, quite literally its foundations, because private property trumped the public interest. Whereas in fact, the republicanism, one of the strict kind of axioms of republicanism in the sense of classic civic republicanism is that the public interest always takes precedence over private interests along these lines. And that was 
the key coordinate. And the only time sacrifice is mentioned in the proclamation is nothing to do with bloodshed. It's, it has to do with sacrifice in the private interest for the common good. So, so this idea that we haven't even caught up with the revolution, let alone with writers like Joyce and Beckett, it's a good question whether even readers have still caught up with Joyce or whether viewers have caught up with Picasso. When Picasso painted Gertrude Stein, someone said, it doesn't look a bit like her. And he said, don't worry, it will. <laughs> it will, it, but not in here and now. And, and this argument that time itself becomes part of a way of negotiating past, present, and the future. But bound up in that is another kind of aspect, which has to do with the notion of representation. And the idea that memory is simply given and is passed on, if you like, to osmosis from generation to generation. Memory is not passed on. Memory is made and remade in each decade and in each generation. And the making of memory does not detract from it. It's actually central to the idea that representation is actually part of memory. And the representation becomes bound up with the event. And in a very powerful way, the event of the Easter Rising was not simply something that happened as a once-off and then is commemorated in the future. The commemoration is part of the rising. They, made a, they took a gamble that they were going to be remembered. And, that, and they knew that this memory was going to be contested in every decade, including some decades it was going to be suppressed. It was going to be annihilated. <coughs> and for three or four decades, the 1916 rising was persona non grata in the public sphere. It was who fears to speak of Easter week. And, and so the battle of memory and commemoration so when John talked earlier about the danger of history passing into heritage in the more commodified sense, that's true. But there's another version of history which is still contested, which is still semi-colonial, which is still hasn't come to a full stop. And it has to do with the memory of contentious events in the Irish past. That it's as if the past in that sense is still part of a continuous present. And this notion that the representation is not after the event, it's part of the event, is crucial to another figure who came up with different presentations. And it's another key figure in the 1916 rebellion, and that's Roger Casement. Because one of the most remarkable <coughs> aspects of Casement's intervention in the Congo and in the Putumayo was the use of the camera, not simply to record events, but to intervene in events. The camera becomes an intervention. The camera becomes an active participator in events because he is accruing evidence. And the camera becomes crucial to his collation and <coughs> gathering of evidence. And this use of the camera and its connection to human rights, there's even an argument that others are better versed than I am, that the camera is essential to the rise of modern humanitarian concepts of human rights. Because mass communications, the globalization of mass communications was central to the idea of long distance suffering, being aware of the fact that people who were distant from us geographically might be proximate to us emotionally through the photograph, through mass communications. <clears throat> so that notion that the camera wasn't just recording but was intervening in events I think that becomes crucial to a lot of what we are seeing in representational practices at the EVE exhibition itself, because the practices are part of ad advocacy. They're not simply neutral aesthetic events. They're part of ad advocacy. And it's no coincidence that the way people talk about adoption is, is true advocacy. You're not the artist as advocate, not simply the artist pairing the fingernails, detached, aloof from events in society. So that idea that the representation is kind of part of the event. Interesting enough, Casement did put one a remarkable caveat in his notion of the efficacy of the camera. And it is that the camera does not speak for itself. The image does not speak for itself. The image 
has no Esperanto of the eye. He, in a very strange kind of qualification of the power of the camera, he said, actually, the, cam the photograph does not speak to all people. You have to have a disposition to see what's in the photograph in the first place. He says, others came to the Congo and saw the suffering. But then in a famous phrase, he says, but I saw through the eyes of another race. A race that was once hunted had conquered itself. So Casement is bringing up this much that the eye, that the optical, that the visual, is culturally coded and is culturally phrased every bit as much as language is. And that the eye itself is part, as a history, and vision itself is part of what I think um, Catalina called the particular, the poetics, if you like, of the particular. So in a sense, what Casement was doing was making a radical move about humanitarianism and universalism. He was cosmopolitan, humanitarian, and universalist, but it was grounded in the particular. It was grounded in a particular history. So this notion of what is now called rooted cosmopolitanism, or what I might call grounded universalism, that the universal always has to be grounded in the particular, or the cosmopolitan in the specific. And that argument needs to be brought more and more into the debates in the visual arts. Because a lot of debates in the visual arts, in terms of modernism in particular, talks about specificity of the medium. And, and the argument tends to be purely formal in terms of debates about medium specificity. But actually, cultural specificity, the notion about the, what constitutes the point of enunciation. Where is the image coming from? Where is the image going to? That images are utterances along the lines of verbal expressions gets very little attention of the kind that case with them. Because case with the same images are, are phrases with one's culture. And it's in that sense, I think, that what we are looking at in the exhibition is very much that notion that people, images are as good as what people bring to them, as well as what people bring out of them. And in that sense, I suppose, we are back again to what might be called the choreography of coincidence. <laughs> or the aesthetics of accidents, in a way. Because the particular, if you like, is the accidental, is the contingent. It's what kind of challenges the systemic, it's what challenges abstract universality. And the particular becomes a kind of obstruction, and becomes a kind of an impasse. And I thought that one of the, one of the kind of, if you like, epiphanic moments of the conference was when Mary Evans drew, drew attention to the accident that I thought was almost good to be true, the accident that interrupted the sequence of emigrants, the accident of the exit that interrupted the sequence of migrants. Because that accident is a gap, and it's almost as if the gap becomes an opening, in the best sense of the word, rather than a closing down. And the gap, instead of disuniting, the gap closes and brings people together. And that extraordinary use that the differences between us, the gaps between us, are what bring us together. Not the, not the bridges. It's very easy to kind of praise the bridges, but then we see the gaps as dissonance. We see the gaps as a threat. We see the gaps as something that has to be overrun. But what Mary Evans' exhibit showed was how much the gap becomes a binding rather than a threatening kind of force. And in that sense, I think, come back to, if you like, some of the earlier exhibits, if, when in Adam Phelan's Roger Casement film, as a throwaway remark, this art historian of a rather strange kind, Giovanni Morelli, is mentioned in passing. What Morelli was infamous for, or famous for, was his idea that paintings were clues. Paintings contained clues. And you inspected a painting to look for the throwaway, the, the clue 
that the artist wasn't aware of. So this is how you knew the authorship of the painting, something, some accidental mannerism or tick of, of the artist. And he latched onto ears as if all the ears are, all, as if all Caravaggio's ears are the same, no matter who he was painting. But he latched onto mannerisms of noses or eyes, which, which is extraordinary in one way, in that he happened to come across another person who was interested in clues, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And Conan Doyle beats Morelli, and, this, and had a lot to talk about. Because Conan Doyle was also on the trail of the Lonesome Pine and on the trail of the accident. But another person who came across this conversation was Sigmund Freud. And Freud was also interested in the accident that gives away more than the deliberate expression. So you, you have this idea that the accidental, that the particular, that the contingent, actually becomes, rather than a, a diversion from the main narrative, it becomes a way of contesting and exposing and exploring, if you like, the <coughs> frailties and the cover-ups and the homogenation of the main narrative. So in that sense, I think the exhibition has, in a sense, brought all these questions into the foreground in a way that is seldom the case in, in Irish art institutions. Because the idea that the aesthetic becomes equipment for living, and that some things escape even ethical and political intervention, unless you bring an aesthetic eye to bear on proceedings, that the aesthetic in some ways becomes a, a key part of filling in the gaps between the ethical and the political, and the personal that often bring us to grief in, in everyday life. So in that sense, I think that the argument about phony memory does have its own accidental history. The word phony, as people may know, is the Irish word fáinne, for a ring. And it derives from Irish hucksters selling fake gold rings to immigrants at Ellis Island on entrance to the United States, when if you proved you were married, you got in. So the Irish never slow to miss a chance to encounter, particularly if exploiting people said, get your, they began to pawn off these phony rings, get your phony here, get, get your, but of course the pronunciation got lost in translation, and, and fáinne comes across as phony, and the Irish ring goes on to tell a different tale. So on that low note, um, <laughs> I think I'll wind up my country. So thanks to everyone, thanks to you for taking time and staying with us.